can be seated. We're going to be in John chapter 3, and if you don't have a Bible, lift your hand, and we'll make sure that you get one in your hand. We have some back there, so um, there's nothing like going to the throne of God and telling, you, telling Him you love Him. I mean, that's so thankful that we have the, the um, avenue of praise that we can do, and we can praise Him and thank Him. It's just a... It's just a powerful thing that we that God's given us the the gift of singing and praise and and even if you can't sing very good, God just says make a joyful noise. You can sing in all the sharps and flats and cover it all. That's okay. Oh, well, we're in John three and uh, um, we'll begin with verse twenty two. And I'll just read to you down to 30 for to, to start with. And then I'm reading out of the New American Standard. And uh, if you're in any other translation, you can follow along. And it pretty much says the same thing in a lot of ways. So um, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. And there he was spending time with them baptizing. Who's he spending time with? With his disciples and their baptizing. As a, as a side note. And John also was baptizing in Aon near Salim because there was much water there and, there and they were coming and were baptized and being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. There arose therefore a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. Now some of your translations, if you're uh, New King James or King James, it says Jews, plural. But every other translation I've read it in, it said Jew. So I don't think it really matters, you know, if, if it was a bunch of them or just one guy. But there was a discussion, and, there, and some of your um, translations say it was a dispute. So, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have borne witness, behold, he is baptizing and all who are all are coming to him. And John answered and said, "A man can receive nothing unless he has been given from has been given from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, and that would be what he's referring to. The friend of the bridegroom will be like the best man. Okay." And the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. And that's a really big part of our lesson. He must increase and we must decrease. John's saying that about his ministry and his character. So it says, after these things, what things um, are that just happened to after these things, well, he went to a wedding at Cana, and he turns wa- he turns water to wine. That was his first miracle and sign that that he was God. And then during that time, he had picked five of his disciples, five of the twelve. Now I don't know where he is in his pick uh, here because he's in Judah, but he has at least five of them with him at this point, probably more. Um, <clears throat> then he came in, and his grand entrance to um, Israel was cleaning the temple. I mean, that's how he got introduced. He walks in, walks in, cleanses the temple. And then right after that, he meets a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And we learned about Nicodemus last few weeks. Um, Nicodemus was a, a, a Pharisee, a top dog teacher. He was like the, uh, the heavyweight of all the religious people in, in Israel at that time. And we get the message and the teaching of the born again doctrine that Jesus taught. So we're, that's where we're at. So he's no longer in Canaan, of course. He's left there, and he's in the land of Judea right now. Now, notice where he says that he's in the land of Judea, and they were spent, and they there he was spending time and baptizing. So he's spending time with his disciples. I like to kind of bring that out. Jesus spent time with his disciples. He knew that they um, needed him to for instruction, and so it's interesting that. And I, I look at all these things like, well. Jesus spent time with them. Uh, if you remember, he sent the 12 out 
And the 12 did all these miracles, and they came back and said, man, the demons are subject to us, and we're praying for people to get saved. All these things are happening. And then Jesus said, well, I want you to come away and get a rest. They had a lot of ministry going on. I want you to come away and get a rest. They get in a boat. They think they're over and across another part of the lake going, we're going to get a break here. They get to the other side, and, and um, the crowd's just crowded in on them. No break at all. I do think, though, guys, that we need, as God's people, breaks. Now, not only leadership in in, um, uh, Bible study leaders or, you know, pastors, but life can get very difficult. And what happens is if we get burnt out, we're not effective for anybody. So there's always that time where you get away to be with Jesus, not just get away I mean, Terry and I get away for our anniversary sometimes, and we get away some other times, but there are times where we designate getting away just to be with the Lord. And we're with each other, but we're not. I mean, we're, we, I don't know, that sounds weird, but, but we spend time and try to figure out what God's saying, and we just need that rest. I need to be um, refreshed from time to time. And I know Jesus knew that about his disciples. So he calls them away, and during their rest time, they're, they're baptizing people. That's interesting. And I do believe at this point, Je- um, Jesus was baptizing with the disciples. Now, over in 4, if you look at that, 4 1 says, And therefore the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and, <clears throat> making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus, Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So here, here you say Jesus wasn't baptizing, but his disciples were. But I think right now he's taking a break, and then let's, let's baptize some people while we're taking a break. And so doing some baptism, and John also was baptizing. And we know there's a place, it's along the Jordan, and it's uh, further north, I think. But John is baptizing also, and, and it's in the area of Salem because there was much water, and they were coming and were being baptized. Who are they? All the people that were getting the baptism of repentance. Now, this baptism was not the Christian baptism that we do today. Um, that didn't happen until Acts chapter 2. So th- these are this baptism that John and Jesus are doing, that is the baptism of repentance, that they're coming to repent. Remember Jesus said, repent and be saved, the first part of the gospel. So he's advocating what John's doing, or in fact, he's doing it. And there's a six-month period where they both kind of do it together. It's like the handing off the, of the baton. John is slowly becoming less. Jesus is slowly becoming more. And the, so the handing off the baton maybe have taken, we think, about six months. They both were, were baptizing. And, uh, and notice 2 and 4, 24 says, um, For John had not yet been thrown in prison. Now, we know John was thrown in prison during this time of his baptism, um, that he baptized, um, I'm sorry, Jesus' baptism, and then where he's at now. So the timeline, I'm not totally sure, um, but you remember about um, John getting thrown in prison. He was outside Herod's palace, and he was saying, hey, um, Herod, what you're doing is wrong. You got your brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and that's not right. That's a Dalton Bay. He was calling him on it. Herod got so mad about it, he had him arrested, and he wanted to have him killed, but he held off for a while. But we do know that later uh, there, was a, there was a party by, by um, um, Herod, and uh, his daughter or his stepdaughter danced in front of him and pleased him. So she, he asked her, what can I give you? I'll give you half my kingdom. He's, he's an idiot, but he said, well, I'll give you half my kingdom. And he said, no, we, I, and then she went to her mom and said, we went the head of John the Baptist. So John lost his head and during this time, but now he's alive and well. This is one of John's last testimonies that he gives us. So I think it's important, um, but he, again, spending time with the disciples is important. The ministries were overlapping, and, I, and that's and during this time. Now, let's see. I just want to bring your attention to John the Baptist. We've talked a little bit about him, but Jesus dubbed him as the greatest man that ever lived in Matthew 11, 11. That's a pretty tall order. And and he was the greatest man that ever lived. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets, if you think about it. Um, And what did the greatest, greatest man on earth ever eat? Outside Jesus, he's God. He he ate locusts and wild honey. That mm And then he had for clothing, he had a camel hair and a leather belt. 
And so he did. He wasn't in the robes and the palaces of great men. Yet God dubbed him and Jesus dubbed him as one of the greatest men that ever lived. It doesn't matter how much money you guys make or where you are in life and the social strata you're at. It has no bearing on it. The greatest man in the world. And yet even to this day, I think he'll hold that, that, that position. Didn't have anything. But he had everything. One thing he had was the greatest message of all, that Messiah had come. He was like a, he was the most powerful preacher. Um, he, he was the ultimate preacher, if you will. And he was the most popular preacher in centuries, past and, and future. Last of the Old Testament prophets. He drew massive crowds, guys. Many people. Now, I always kind of picture John. And you see it in the, in, the, in the Passion or some of the movies that he's standing out in the desert yelling at people. And, and, and there's, a, there's a little creek there and he's about 40 or 50 people there and he's baptizing him. And it wasn't like that at all. This man, when he spoke, uh, like E.F. Hutton, everybody listened and they came to him by the scores. The whole nation of Israel came to be baptized, the baptism of repentance, which was the same baptism that Jesus was performing and again, that until Acts chapter 2, we don't have the, uh, the baptism that we practice today. Um, so I thought that was inter- interesting, but this man gave the greatest message ever heard. It was Messiah has come. Do you imagine being that guy? And then he is referred to as the bridegroom or the, the, the bridegroom's friend, which means it's his best man. And I don't know if you knew this, but the best man in the Jewish culture, he... he um, they were prepared like six months, a year ahead of time, the wedding. And during this preparation, the best man would go to the, the bride and kind of fill her in where they're at on their progress of the wedding. So she, he would go there. And then when the wedding happened, the best man would walk the bride up, not the father, but the best man would walk the bride up into the hands of, of the groom. John did that really well. He has introduced people and introduced us to Jesus. And he's let the baton go, and now we are depending totally upon him. He fulfilled what he, he was going to do in being, in being in that type of person. And then it said there arose a discussion. Now, what was the discussion or dispute about? Well, let's kind of, uh, kind of look at it. They, they came, they saw Jesus well, they heard Jesus was baptizing, and this Jew or these Jews were discussing probably whose baptism is more important. Well, we, we get baptized by Jesus, and his are really, and then they said, well, we're the originator, you know, and they're talking about the baptism of John and Jesus. It's called, it's called the matter of purification, which means, which we think means baptism. And so they were talking about, like, which one was the greatest? Um, as far as that goes, what the better baptism. Now, I can only speculate, so I can't say, thus saith the Lord. But there was a dispute, and it was between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, or if it were just one. And uh, so, now notice what they say. John, Rabbi, hey, listen, um, he who you baptize at the Jordan, which is Jesus, I don't know, why didn't he use Jesus' name? He said, he. I think this is kind of like showing us that the guys didn't really want to mention his name. They're maybe a little jealous. And instead of saying Jesus, uh, you know, they said, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, and that'd be Jesus, to whom you have borne witness, had to be Jesus. Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So he said, now I think there's a little exaggeration because they all weren't coming to Jesus. There were still a lot of them coming to John. But so what we, what a lot of your scholars speculate, and as I read it, I think there's some jealousy going on there a little bit. So man, he's baptizing and, um, and you know, all these people are coming and what do we do? <laughs> you know, in Mark 9.38, you remember when the disciples were doing their thing and um, they were out ministering one time and they came back to Jesus and said, Jesus, in Mark 9, 38 through 40, you can read it. He said, we saw some guys casting out demons. So you know what we did? We told them, stop. They're not one of us. And the Lord said, hey, um, don't tell them to stop. If they're not against me, they're for me. Don't stop these guys. I mean, they're thinking they're doing Jesus a favor. And uh, 
I, I kind of compare that to today. Well, our church is better than your church. Or that's, this ministry is better than your ministry. Now, I know there's different ministries that we don't adhere to. But guys, there are all kinds of ministries and missions, um, denominations, parachurch groups, missionaries um, that do things different. And for us to point the finger and say, well, if they don't do it like we do, like five worship songs in the message or, you know, um, we, could, we could put all kinds of legalism. And so the Lord was saying, hey, if they're not against me, they're for me. He wasn't advocating, and I'm not advocating unity at any cost. I'm not talking about unitarianism at all. I'm just saying how we ought to behave around our brothers and sisters. And I think these guys are just elevating John just a little bit higher than John is comfortable with. Um, but I think there's a possible jealousy going there. They're all coming to him. Um, numbers, if you remember in Numbers chapter 11, 26 through 30, um, Moses had appointed men to prophesy. I think it was a 70 at that time, I'm not sure. But he, pro he appointed men to prophesy. And the guy by the name of Eldad and Medad, that's what, Medad, so I tell Josh, Medad, you son. <laughs> Eldad and Medad, uh, they, they came to um, uh, Joshua they said, Joshua, these two guys are prophesying, and they're not one of us. And, you know, so, and so Joshua took that information and went to Moses and said, Moses, there's these two guys, Eldad and Medad, they're prophesying, and they're not one of us. And Moses' response was similar to what Jesus' response. He goes, hey, listen, I would to God that everybody would prophesy or everybody would preach. In other words, guys, don't stop people from doing God's will if they don't do it your way. Or in, in, the, in the vein that you think they should do it in. You know what I mean? I mean, I know there's a lot of people believe differently than we do. We're right, and they're wrong. No, I, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, guys, because I have to say that because I do believe it. But it doesn't separate me from <clears throat> my good brothers and sisters. It really doesn't. Um, so they were saying, you know, and, and Moses said, hey, man, I wish they all would prophesy and all preach. Um, in Philippians 1, 15 through 18, um, Paul, and you can read, let me just read it to you. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but, all, <clears throat> but some from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. And understand that, you know, selfish ambition. What then, only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So what Paul's saying is that there's guys out there while I'm in prison trying to cause me a hard time preaching the gospel, and they got selfish motives. Their motives aren't right, but you know what? Christ is being preached, and in that I will rejoice. He didn't call them on it, and you know what? There's a lot of people probably that are out there that, that are preaching the gospel, but it isn't in, co in context with pure motives. Uh, but I think that we need, you know, it's time that we pull together. We can't do this ourselves. There's a whole, lot of a whole lot of sin out there. Christ is getting ready to come back. The world is in like major chaos. I mean, every week there's something crazy new. And we, we need our brothers and sisters. I love Harvest Chapel. I love our doctrine. I adhere to it. But I'm not so narrow-minded that I can't jo join arms with other brothers and sisters in Christ and do the work of the ministry. Amen. It's so important. And I do believe that these disciples of John, they were elevating John a little bit higher than John was comfortable with. They said, man, John... Jesus is over here baptizing, but, you know, you're the one that did it. You're the one that started it all out. So, so I, you know, that's when, and we'll get to that, but he said, he should increase and I should decrease. I have to, and he's telling them, guys, it's not me. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Amen. Guys, it's not about you, so get over yourself. It's about Jesus. Quit thinking about yourself and all the world. It's all about Jesus. When you talk about people, tell them about Jesus. When you tell them your woes, tell them how Jesus got you out of your woes. Sometimes we get stuck on our woes and we don't even put Christ in the equation. 
So he said, he must increase and I must decrease. You know, today's churches, I believe, especially the woke churches, but today, today's churches um, exalt leaders and pastors, and the result is as they exalt them so much and elevate them that they're, they're celebrity pastors, celebrity um, men of God, if you will. There's a mega church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, it has like 20 satellite churches, and uh, they lay claim to having 25,000 members that, that go to all their, their churches. But anyway, it's a mega church, and I'm not dogging the mega church. I'm just saying this one just happens to be. But what they've done is that they count the number of baptisms, and then they put it on their roster. Well, what's happened is they, they um, actually... They call it spontaneous baptism, but they'll place 15 people in the congregation in strategic places, and then when the pastor will say, will you come forward and be baptized? What? I mean, they don't even, I don't even know them, but come forward and be baptized, and, and they thought, well, since nobody will go down on their own, we'll send lures. So these 15 people have already been baptized, and they're, um, they're already a part of the church, but they walk down and pretend like they're baptized so they can get the other people to come fact and uh it's crazy so uh, they, they even wrote a, a guide and it says spontaneous baptize baptism a guide to how do to do it they've even got a guide that tells you in your church how, so if i were to say hey if anybody wants to be baptized um and nobody you know really responds to the call people start getting up from places that they know there'll be a scene and i think that's pretty sad in colossians it says don't lie to one another Colossians 3 9, and it's a lie. And in fact, they said in 2010, they had 289 baptisms, and then in 2011, it rose to 2,400 in one year. So what's happening is they're, they're, they're rigging the numbers, they're making, they're manipulating people, and, uh, and this, this pastor. He's a celeb. He, um, they have all, we, use, we use some of the worship songs that come out of that church. And he writes some of them. He's written books. And they really, and I'm, I'm just afraid that these people are elevating their pastor a little too much. They are, they're so popular that when they advertise Easter, which I don't advertise at Easter, but Resurrection Day, they will not use the word resurrection day in their advertisement. They will not use the word crucifixion. This is the same church. They won't even use the word because that's not the lingo of the day. So they get people in. And guys, hey, that's a resurrection of Jesus Christ. How else can you say it? I mean, why in the world would you just say, oh, you just come and we'll tell you a little bit about this guy who gave us hope. That's how they introduce it. Or the crucifixion, guys, that, that, was a, that was a rugged death. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. Crucifixion is in my vocabulary, Amen. and I just don't think I can take it out. Amen. I just, and I, I'm, I'm a little concerned what happens in our churches, guys. Verse 27, Jesus answered and John answered and said to them, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So what he's saying is, guess what? Jesus is having success and a great amount of success. And I believe it's from heaven because God gave him the power and he's slowly training his disciples to get their eyes off of him. Now, guys, when we disciple people, men or women, when we disciple people, a lot of times when people are just new in the Lord, what happens is they get a little attached to us and you get phone calls like, you know, you know, all the time. Hey, I don't know what to do here. And, and your whole goal was be to reflect their need off of you onto Jesus. And when you're working with people, they should not be dependent on you, although they may at first, but we've got to wean them off of uh, that. We're not the answer, guys. And if you're doing discipleship just because you want to be liked or you have a need to be met you're not you're not doing it right it's because we love people and we love jesus none of us are perfect so i'm not that's i hope that's not coming across that way but but anyway so i do believe they got a little bit um jealous there now proverbs chapter 6 verse 34 says jealousy enrages a man 
and you've heard of crimes of passion where um, one of the spouses finds their spouse with somebody else and they just kill them. I mean, jealousy has a major factor uh, in, in anger, and it's amazing. So jealousy enrages a man. So for us to be jealous should not be in our um, repertoire, our, our, our vocabulary, in our thought process. First Samuel 18.8. Remember when um, David came on board with Saul, and he was sending David out to do all, all the work and all the military battles. And um, so what would happen when David would come back, the ladies had made up a song, David killed his 10,000, and Saul just killed his thousands. I don't know how they did it. And it enraged Saul. And he's going, man, they're saying David killed his 10,000, and I only killed 1,000. And it made him so mad that when David got in his presence, he began ch chucking spears at him. Hey, would you play your harp and let me just chuck a spear at you? I mean, he became so jealous of David that it enraged him. Guys, when that jealousy begins, if it is, and it should not even be in the heart of, of a believer. I know what happens. But we need to check it. Remember Joseph's brothers. What happened there? Joseph's brothers hated Joseph because Jacob picked Joseph as his favorite. I mean, they knew it too. I mean, Jacob wasn't the best father. I'm not, you know, I hope I get in heaven. He didn't reprimand me for that, but. But he wasn't none, and some of you guys, they, some of the guys weren't very good fathers or parents, but he favored Joseph and made him like this multicolored tunic, and, and they hated him. And I remember they were out watching sheep, and Joseph was told by his dad to go find him, and they saw him coming from a distance, and he saw his multicolored tunic and said, let's kill him. So they were going to kill him. Instead, they threw him in a well, and they had this big plan. Anyway, Joseph lived, but they hated him. Why? Because they were jealous. Now, I don't know why I'm hitting this so hard, but I just think the Lord had me this. Jealousy is not good. There's a lot of things about it. In fact, um, remember the labors in the vineyard in Matthew 20, verse 12, where like the guy came and he found a bunch of guys at 8 in the morning and he said, hey, listen, I'll give you, I think it was a denera, to work all day in the field. Sure. Then some, he comes back at noon, and he finds some more guys. He says, hey, I'll give you a dinero, same thing I'm giving the other guys, if you come out and work in the field. And then he saw some about that, about, probably about 3 o'clock, and shift is over at 5. I'm, and he said, you guys want to come out and work in the field? I'll give you a dinero. And then when they all came to get paid, the guys that were there all day said, hey, <laughs> we worked all day, and we only get what they get. Jealous. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But we can fall into that so easy. They became really, very jealous because they didn't get, they should have got more pay. James says about it, Jesus' brother, in James 3.16, that where there's, and you can put it up there, for where there's jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder and every kind of evil thing. Look at the two things that are there. If you've got a group of people that are jealous of each other, or are, you know what I mean, in a family or in a church, guess what? There is disorder. I've seen that happen in Bible studies, in churches, and even churches I've been a part of, because people are jealous of one another. But then it says, every evil thing. So what does the word every mean? Everything. Every evil. I mean, Demonic activity, I mean, when you have people that are gathered together and there's jealousy in the ranks, guys, guess what? Every evil thing is there. And that should never be, and I just pray, and I thank you for you guys remaining, most of you, in the unity of, of Harvest Chapel, that you guys love one another, we're, and if there's any jealousy, hey, just take care of it today. Say, um, if you've got any, any inclination that you're jealous or, you know, you, you just are angry because of that, then I would just say take care of it. James 4, 5. This is where the Lord says, He jealously desires the spirit which he has made dwell in us. God is a jealous God. Did you know that? He's a jealous God. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4, 24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. 
Deuteronomy 5.9 says the same thing. Deuteronomy 6.15 says the same thing. Joshua 24.19 says the same thing. So how come God can be jealous and not us? Well, he's perfect. Spurgeon says it like this. Let it be remembered that the jealousy is not evil in and of itself, or it would have never been ascribed to God. Jealousy is ever pure, is ever a pure and holy flame. I love my wife, and I'm jealous for my wife. I'm not jealous that she's going to go out and do anything, and I totally trust her. We both have given our marriage to Jesus, and as long as we're under his lordship, we're in love with one another. And so, and I'm jealous if she would go out, but I, that's not, I'm jealous that, I'm thankful that, I, that we love one another. My kids, I love them. I'm jealous. I want the best for them. I want them to, to grow up in Christ. <laughs> Zechariah says this about um, God. Zechariah 1.14. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and, and Zion. I mean, exceedingly. Like, that's, how big is exceedingly? It's like big, big. And he's not talking about just the city and Zion, the mountain. He's talking about what it stands for, God and his people. I'm, ze- I'm, I'm jealous for that. It says, God will make Israel jealous. And, and well, here's another thing that he's done as far as jealousy. Israel has fallen away from him. So the Gentiles have, have been coming into the kingdom. And what he says about that, he says, the Gentiles, by them coming into the kingdom, has made Israel jealous. And they want to come back to God because the Gentiles, they're just saying, you Gentiles, you, you don't keep the law. You don't know anything about the Torah. How can you be close to God? And so they become jealous. And that's just a type of jealousy that God will use. I looked up the word jealous in Joshua 24, 19. He is a jealous, a jealous God. Um, the Hebrew word is quino. And it really, it's a different kind of word, but it means to die. And I think that's interesting. And, and, and it, so basically, when we are becoming jealous, it means that we're, to, you know, that's going to put be the death of us, if you, if you will. Um, but I think, again, jealousy, we should not be found on the lips of believers. And, um, and, get, and when Moses told them, when he was, they told Moses, hey, these other guys are prophesying, what do we do? And Moses said, hey, let which they all would. You cannot make a humble man jealous. And, the, and I like what MacArthur said, the number one law in ministry is to be humble. That's the number one law of ministry. I agree with him. And you couldn't make Moses jealous. You couldn't make John jealous about Jesus doing that. Why? Because he was a humble man. He knew his call. He knew his place. When you walk in humility, guys, it really alleviates a lot of problems with the relationships. Totally. It, God does a, mat- it does a, a big work. When John said he must increase and I must decrease, that's when he enacted the law, the first ministry of the law, humility. Are you walking in humility this morning? Do you feel like that you, uh, you are loving your brother above yourself? Are you putting others before you? And this is what John was doing. He was glad that he was kind of coming out of, the, out of the, the leadership of baptism here. Verse 28, you yourselves bear with me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been made and set before him. I have been sent before him. So basically, he was the best man, and he's going before Christ. And, and so we sometimes will be a John the Baptist to somebody else. We could be the one that draws them to Christ. My John the Baptist was Meb Buntrick. I've told you this. She prayed for me, the Southern Baptist lady, from when I was really wee little, and she would pray for me that I would come to Christ. And, uh, um, and she was like a John the Baptist yelling out in the wilderness, you know, repent. She would tell me, Tom, tell me you got to quit doing all them drugs. And, uh, 
you need to get saved. And I was going, I'd see her, she'd continually preach at me. And finally, it took. But we all have someone in our life that either they irritate you, maybe they don't irritate you. But we need people to help us stay on track, even that also. Amen. And he said that I am not the Christ. Remember when they were asking him, who are you? Are you, you know, are you the Christ? Are you a prophet? Who are you? And what did he say? I'm just a voice in the wilderness paving the way for Jesus. That's us, guys. We're nothing. All we are is a voice in the wilderness paving the way for Christ. We need to get completely out of the way and get out of ourselves. It's not about you. It's not about your problems. It's about Jesus. And I know that we have problems and we need to be console, I mean, comforted and things like that. But there comes a time where we just say, okay, it's ready. I'm ready. Put me in the game. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. Remember that song by Credence? Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play, Lord. I'm, I want to do what you want me to do. Paul was, again, a good example of humility. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verses 1 through 4, to sum it up, well, we can put it up there and you can read it, but he said, I didn't come to you with superiority of speak or speech. I came in fear and weakness. So he's saying that I didn't have all these persuasive words. I didn't demonstrate. I, I just preached the gospel. And you saw the power in, in what I was doing. I just make a confession. I come up here almost every Sunday, if not every. I, I, I fear sometimes. I come up, I'm going, Lord, you got to speak through me. I, I You know, I know that the Lord's given me the ability to share his word, but I fear. And, and I'm not trying to be humble. I'm not trying to make you feel like, oh, Mark, Tommy's so humble. It's just I, I fear because I want to make sure I say the right things. You guys carved your Sunday morning out to come here and sit in a chair and hear somebody talk about Jesus. Well, let's hope that it's more than that, but that you're going to hear from God and that I get completely out of the way. We are here because we love Jesus. And I'm so thankful that God uses us even despite our idiosyncrasies. And so when he says, I didn't come to you in superiority of speech, I, I, I say amen to that. Amen. I don't have any education. I, I have my own little Tomisms, I say. They're probably not even right. But all, and you, you guys, I want, want you to know that's what God wants to do with you. Use you. He wants to use you. You don't have to be perfect, but just to use you. In 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we don't preach ourselves, but... Christ Jesus as Lord. That's what Paul said. I'm not preaching myself. I'm not, I don't have a lot of books to, to, to sell. I don't have CDs. We're preaching Christ and Him crucified. Not promoting His ministry. I, I love that. And 1 Peter 5 says, Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. So walking in humility, again, the first law of any ministry, anything you do, even sharing with your children the gospel or reading them their devotions, you need to do it in humility. Everything that we do, clothe yourself with it. MacArthur said, all ministers are like night stars. They flicker and they fade out of sight as the sun begins to rise. And that's all we are, just like stars. And when Jesus begin, begins to rise in our life, guys, we fade away. As the church goes more and more apostate, Here's what's happening. They think less and less of Christ and make more of their ministers. They make more out of their ministers than what they should or their ministries. So they keep elevating and elevating and elevating until they become bizarre. And I can say amen to that. You watch people elevate ministries or men and it gets bizarre, it gets weird. I mean, some of the things I see that's passing for Christianity, I'm going, oh my Lord, have mercy. He, verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly. Notice what he says. He's rejoicing greatly. This would be John um, because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been full. Just hearing the bridegroom's voice 
it just goes back to that point where Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow. And I know when in 1977 I heard the voice of Jesus. I didn't hear anything audible. But my sheep hear my voice and they follow. And we are to be the voice of Jesus. That's what God's called us to do. To go out and, and, and mouth all of his works and all of his goodness. And he said, this gives me great joy, John did. The greatest joy that I have is being able to be used by God. I mean, I, I'm so blessed by, by what God's done. I, I, I stand before you, and, I'm, you know, we all go through rough stuff, but it seems like God's got me in a, a passage of time where I'm just really, really thankful that I'm alive and that God's using me, and I want that to reflect on you guys. Are you thankful that God loves you, and you even got a job, and you got, you got what you got? Man, we got so much just because we're, we know Jesus. And my joy is becoming fuller and fuller. Now, nothing can steal my joy. It may damper it, but my joy is, is in the Lord. In fact, in the presence of, the God, of God, there's joy forevermore. And that Jesus said, the joy that I have, I want to give you the joy that I have. That's the joy we can have. And again, as he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's not about us. Now, let me move to 31, and we'll close up at 31 through 36 here. But he who comes from above is, is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth, and he who speaks of the earth, he who comes from heaven is above all. Basically, what now I believe at this point, um, John the Apostle took the pen. I think... John the Baptist, or they both were, I believe John the Apostle was there through all this, writing it down, but now these are the thoughts of John the Apostle. Some of your scholars said, no, it's John the Baptist still. But I think the language sounds a whole lot like John in, the, in his writings, in his gospel, in his epistles. And when he says, he comes from above, is above all. John is writing this down. This is what he's learning. Christ did come from heaven. Christ came and died for our sins. Christ is a part of the Trinity, and he came from above. Verse 32, what he has seen and heard of that he bears witness, and no one receives his witness. So basically, what Jesus has seen and heard, of course, that would be everything. Um, he bears witness, but no man receives his witness. Many will, will not listen to the, the gospel Many people will hear the gospel, but they will turn away. That's so sad. And are you going to be the one that hopefully that shares with them that they can turn back? He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. So do you know that God is true and there's no lie in God at all? That's what John, 1 John, when you read 1 John, I like in 1 John 5, 12 and 13, um, he said, he who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son has not life. That's the language I believe is he's expressing here. If you got Christ, you're alive, but if you don't, you're dead. Then he says in the next verse, and these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. And again, I've said this over and over, and you're going to hear it again. You, not have to, you don't have to worry or wonder or guess or hope that you're saved. You can know he who has the Son has life. Has anybody got the Son in here? I, I hope so. It's a good time to say that because we do have him in our heart. And God is true. He doesn't lie. He said, what, just like Jesus said, you know, um, I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would not have said it. But in my Father's house, there are many mansions there. And I believe it's one big house with lots and lots of rooms is what I think it is. And big, big table where we can eat a lot and play football in the yard. It's my father's house. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the spirit without measure. Now what does he mean he gives the spirit without measure? He did not give the prophets, nor the disciples or the apostles or the kings, 
The, the, he didn't give them the full measure of his spirit. Christ is the only one that has the full measure of his spirit. But you and I have little, little bits and pieces of it, and that's why we work together, because your piece fits with my piece. And Peter said, you know, we're put together as a house, stone by stone. Chip a little off here to get Tom to sit here with Trent. And, you know, we chip stuff off of them, and then we get our, our stones together, and we begin to work. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. So what is the all things? It just means all things, and even judgment. We talked about last week, so let me just reiterate it. Christ did not come the first time to judge the world, but to save the world. But the second time he comes, he's going to judge. And um, he will judge. He is the judge, not the Father, but who? The Son will judge all men, mankind before the great white throne judgment. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. And we talked about eternal, meaning not the longevity or how long it is, but it is the quality of life. That you will have life as Zoe, eternal is like the quality of what life we get when we're saved. But he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, I don't know how the wrath of God looks on people. <laughs> I always thought... Look here, Margaret, that guy's got the wrath of God on him. What does that look like? I don't know what it looks like. But we who don't believe in Jesus abide in, in the wrath of God. Basically, it means you're not blessed. It means that your life is pretty much not worth much unless you come to Jesus. And, and I don't want the wrath abiding on me. Why? Because, well, I don't have to because Jesus took the wrath. He took all my sins. He took the penalty of, my, of everything that I have ever done, and he took it upon himself. So God is not mad at me or you anymore. He's not mad at us. He's not you know, wailing his ball bat, trying to smack you upside the head to make you behave. He loves you, and he's looking for every opportunity to bless you. Amen. And, and uh, so I think at this point, We'll close out, and I want to leave you with this, that if you're here this morning, and again, every, every Sunday we have maybe new people that come. We're so thankful that you're here. And if you're new here or just been coming, um, I just want to put it out to you. Do, you. do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him as your Savior, not as just a good man or a prophet? Or maybe he's God. Is he your personal God? Have you asked Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins? So as you all stand and we sing, we just want to invite you to come forward. And if you'd like to have prayer, maybe you're here and you just feel like you just need prayer because you're walk with the Lord.